Welcome. So for, for the new faces who've come to hear Phyllis, my name is Charles Small, and I'm the director of ISGAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. <laughs> um, before we start, I'd like to mention that after the lecture, there's going to be a reception with wine and food, so please stick around in honor of Phyllis's book. Um, I'd like to mention some dignitaries here. My parents are here from Montreal. <laughs> So they're dignitaries. dignitaries, the most dignitary. And uh, David Menashri, uh, professor of Iranian studies from Tel Aviv University and active on these issues uh, that we're dealing with for many decades, is a friend of Isgak is here. Many dignitaries. Yeah, many. And to the, to the friends. So tonight... Wait, wait, we what? have Nama, Sandro, and Bill Myers. We have Rabbi Nachai Schmidman. We have Francine Herbida. You can't hear me? No, we can't hear Oh, my hey. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very demanding crowd. As, as, as it should be. I was naming other dignitaries here. My Rabbi Schmidman and Chai, the Rebbitson, and Bill Myers, the greatest photographer, and Nama Sandro, a Yiddishist, and Aviva Kanta, who goes way back, way back, and Frida Foreman, who gave us a treasury, it's a, nice a treasury of translations from Yiddish women's writings, long lost, and my son, talking about dignitaries, and my very <laughs> dear, my son Ariel, and my very dear friend Merle Huffman, and my colleague, Lori Regan, um, and who am I? For, and Judy Jacobson from the SPME days from Columbia, and Leon, who goes steady with her. <laughs> and fair enough. Yeah. All right, that's good. It's a Hamish crowd. If I have forgotten anyone, it's because I can't see you or I don't remember your name. <laughs> Forgive me. All right, I'm taking back the mic. All right. So. Um, today, as you know, we're doing a special book launch for Phyllis's uh, launching of the new anti-Semitism book that was just uh, published by Geffen Publishing in Israel. And if you, the books are for sale after the lecture. And I'm not going to list all of the publications and the amazing titles and professorships that Phyllis has had. I think many of you know who she is, but I, I really. It's, um, it's an honor to do this event with you. And it's really an honor. You know, the first event that ISGAP ever did was uh, before we existed. The first lecture I ever organized on anti-Semitism was inviting Phyllis to, uh, to New Haven in uh, 2002, 2003, when, three. The, the three, three. when the book just came out. I remember looking in Barnes and Noble and I saw this book. I had just moved from Israel to, to the US and I picked up this book. And I said, I had to meet Phyllis. And we, it was an amazing lecture. And also, you know, my mother's here in part. I know she came to visit me, but in part because of Phyllis's <laughs> ground, groundbreaking work on women's issues and, and other related issues. And that Phyllis has really been fighting for, for human rights, for the dignity of women, for the dignity of the other, and certainly for the dignity of Jewish people and Jewish rights to self-determination. And she's really, she was, you know, this was the first book, I would say, in the contemporary era that made an impression on the scholars and at the public at large. So it really is, and not as the cliche, but it really is a privilege to be here with you and thank you for coming here. Phyllis Chester. Um, all right, now this is a long lecture and it's intense, but it's the, the subject is the cost of exposing anti-Semitism and the even higher cost of failing to do so. I am a Jew, a feminist, an academic, a civil libertarian. I believe in universal human rights. I am not a multicultural relativist. I do not follow Edward Said or the post-colonial academy. I oppose it which indeed brought about the Palestinianism of intellectual reality and which projected Islam's apartheid practices onto blameless Israel. Although indeed I sought an expansion of the dead white male canon, 
I oppose the consequent worship of victim status, the balkanization of identity, and identity politics. Today, we are up against dangerous demagogues whom we have allowed to flourish on campus and in the media. Would we allow a professor to teach that the earth is flat and reward him for teaching junk science? Imagine this professor had a following which demonizes, intimidates, and death threatens all those who believe that the earth is round. Such behavior is typical of Islamists or Stalinists, but I'm talking about the Western intelligentsia. What is frightening now about campus anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, is that all of the Israel apartheid weeks and the BDS campaigns have become so familiar a part of the North American university. And such big lies events have become normalized. They have been well organized by the Muslim Brotherhood through their Muslim Student Association and Students for Justice in Palestine. These are Muslim Brotherhood fronts, and they're very effective and they're very well funded. Already, Jewish students have to be rescued from the campus police from Gaza-like mob attacks and riots. Well, what next? Broken bones, a concussion, God forbid, a murder? It is inevitable. And then the usual suspects will say, there's no connection between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, which in any event is protected free speech. And this is an isolated event, the murderer, a lone mentally ill man, or a freedom fighter who's 19 years old, whose family lost everything in the Nakba, and he still cannot get over it. That means he was hardly born when this happened. Now, one pays a price for telling the truth, especially where Jew hatred and Islam are concerned. Others have paid a far greater price than I have. They write under pseudonyms, they live in hiding, they live in exile, and with round-the-clock protection. They are demonized as racists, they are death-threatened, they're sued into poverty. And their names are well known. We know their names, right? Salman Rushdie was the first known to us, but alas, not the last. My allies in Muslim countries have been jailed, they've been tortured, they've been executed. And right now I'm just thinking of one, the Saudi blogger, Raouf Badawi, who in 2012 was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment and 1,000 lashes to be delivered 50 at a time as well as a huge fine of 175,000 pounds, which has gone up to 200 something thousand pounds. What was his crime? He launched a website, Free Saudi Liberals, and encouraged debate on religious and political matters. His first flogging took place earlier this year, and it was public and videotaped, and you could hear the crowd cheer and whistle and call out, Allahu Akbar. Now, I live in a democracy, and my punishment has not been this. It has not been this savage. I have not been physically beaten. I haven't been imprisoned. I haven't been tortured. I haven't been murdered. And it will never happen. My books have not been physically burned. But what I'm about to share has meaning only if you are a public intellectual. Thus, after a very long and successful career, I find that my work, both past and current, has been disappeared by those who once praised it. I have been cast into a very peculiar kind of gulag. My punishment is this. My earned credibility and economic survival have been compromised so that I cannot be the kind of effective advocate for Israel and the West that I believe this struggle requires. This is equivalent to having one or both arms tied behind your back every single day as you engage in the battle of ideas upon which civilizations rise or fall. From the early 1970s to the early 21st century, my books often receive front page reviews in the mainstream media and my face graced popular magazine covers. And my books were translated into many European languages 
and into Japanese and Korean and Chinese and Hebrew. I was a professor for nearly 30 years. I was a popular lecturer. I was a feminist activist and the co-founder of many national and international feminist organizations that are still standing 40 years later. Now, I had been troubled by anti-Semitism beginning in the very early 1970s, and I didn't make it the primary focus of my work, but I did speak and I did act. I tried to persuade feminist leaders to sign petitions which oppose the infamous Zionism equals racism petition at the UN, which has legalized Jew hatred. I brought journalists to Israel to see if I would have a change of mind and heart, and I sometimes did and sometimes not. I worked with the nascent feminist movement there. I convened the first ever panel. This is not even in Aviva Cantor and I were involved in early organizing of Jewish feminists in 73 and then at the McAlpin Hotel in the mid-70s, but that was really looking at sexism in Judaism. It wasn't looking at the hatred of Jews masked as anti-Zionism. And so I convened the first ever panel on feminism and anti-Semitism at the National Women's Studies Association in 1981 in stores. And I'm one of the founders of the Women of the Wall struggle, and the good news, the great news, is that today they prayed at the Kotel in the women's section, a group of 20, with a Torah. I think it was smuggled in under Harry Potter invisibility cloak. No, I don't know how. It was not a big deal. It was just another davening. It was, and it was done for a very noble purpose. One of our main leaders is very ill, so this was also in her honor and to pray for a refuah shlema for her. Very quiet, no violence, very wonderful. But so I didn't publicly break with the feminist left over the Soviet era style anti-Zionism. Also, I once lived in the Muslim world and I moved in Muslim and ex-Muslim dissident circles and I still do. And this made me in the past an exceptionally trendy Jew, very assimilated, secular, pro-Muslim, pro-Arab, blah, blah. And then I worked for the United Nations and I went to, uh, there was a conference on women presumably in Copenhagen in 1980, only it wasn't about women at all. It was to demonize Israel, one state only. And it was choreographed and organized by the Arab League, by, the, by Iran, by Palestinians, and by European leftists. And it was a psychological pogrom. It was, I've never saw anything like this before. And immediate, but I knew what I was seeing. So immediately afterwards, I flew to Israel, I took meetings. I was on the front pages of the media talking about the return of anti-Semitism. Israelis assured me that this had nothing to do with them, that this was from the past. One nation fights with another, not a problem. But then I came back here in 1980, 1980, I took meetings, as the phrase goes in Hollywood, with Jewish American organizations and I said, listen, the propaganda war that's going to come down against us requires that we train the coming generations in the language of liberation and oppression. And uh, we also need to understand Islam. I got a very respectful hearing, <laughs> but it led nowhere. And I thought, well, it's because I'm a girl. No, recently, our colleague Richard Landis told me that he had argued a similar case in the 1990s and got nowhere as well. That means that we've lost 35 to 60 years in terms of combating the lethal war of ideas against us. In the year 2000, I was really shaken by Arafat's intifada, by the two reservists who were lynched in Ramallah, and all the media talking heads showed it bloodlessly, without affect. They didn't say barbarism, they didn't say lynching, they didn't say racism, they just showed it. Then I knew the bloody beast was back, and then remember how quickly the Muhammad al dura blood libel went viral. It was on t-shirts, it was on mugs, it was a lawsuit in France, it was a rallying cry. It was proof that the IDF purposely kills Palestinian children. This is such a big lie. So 
suddenly the propaganda war that I knew was in process was all over us, was coming down. It dominated the world stage. Then we had 9-11, which tore a hole through history in my own city, our own city. And bin Laden's early pronouncements were anti-Zionist, anti-Christian, anti-American, anti-Jewish. And I understood that a great evil had been unleashed, not only against Muslims, that's who they practice on each other, but against civilians everywhere, anywhere, and against the values of post-enlightenment Western civilization. This theme had claimed me, and dare I say, it had chosen me. I saw that a slow motion holocaust was taking place in Israel, a holocaust that remained invisible to most of the world in 2001, 2002, when Israeli civilians were being blown up in cafes and nightclubs and hotels and buses and supermarkets, remember? I began writing around the clock. <clears throat> possessed. And I wrote then that anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism and that a perfect storm was underway, coming to us from the Islamic world, which had for centuries persecuted, murdered, taxed, and exiled Jews and infidels, not to mention their own women, a world <coughs> which is now allied with a politically correct Western intelligentsia. Perfect storm. <laughs> very suicidal on our part. <clears throat> My Jewish and left liberal editor on the new anti-Semitism castigated me and he said, are you sure you want to say this? Are you sure you're comfortable? Are you sure you're right? And I said, I am. He was not happy. And then in 2003, I published the book. It was as if I had not spoken but paradoxically, oddly, my words were treated as traitorous. So for the first time in my career, the mass media wasn't interested in reviewing, even to condemn my work or in interviewing me. Being disappeared in progressive and mainstream circles was a new experience for me. So three months passed and the New York Times had not reviewed the book. So I wrote and I asked why. I said, is the subject not timely? Have there been too many other books lately? Uh, can it be because I'm a woman? Surely that can't be the reason. So Bill Keller, who was the incoming managing editor at the time, wrote back to me, and I saved it. I have it. If you are accusing Chip McGrath, who was the Times book review editor, of being an anti-Semite, then you are a neurotic, paranoid woman. Well, I had not mentioned anti-Semitism in my letter, purposely. But undeterred, I found another reporter who was the head of the education desk in Washington, D.C., not someone who I knew. It turned out she had tried to review this book, but they wouldn't let her do it. But I said, forget about the book. And I offered her access to about 25 professors all over the country who had run into deep trouble when they brought up Israel or when they defended Israel. Uh, and they wrote to me about their plight on campus, having read the book. She started to work the story, and then several weeks went by, and she got back to me, and she said, well, all I can tell you is I've been stopped at the highest levels. Now, ironically, my first piece, which was about the anti-Semitic intelligentsia, had been rejected by the New York Times and by the Washington Post. I dutifully sent it off there. So I turned to Front Page, a conservative website, and it was a site that had just savaged this very book savaged it. It was Judy Lash Bellint who wrote a bitter, bitter review saying, where were you before? Now the feminists are waking up. Too late. But they allowed me to rebut it. So they published this new piece and within 48 hours or less, the anti-Zionist filmmaker, a Swedish brilliant filmmaker, Luk Lucas Moodison, allowed his work to be shown in Israel. He had before that said no, and then he fought with me, how dare you, and then he changed his mind. So publishing it front page made a difference. And this is the first essay in Living History, which is the book that has literally just come out on the front line for Israel and the Jews 2003 to 2015. Then in 2003, the second article was about a near riot that occurred when I delivered a speech 
at a student-sponsored conference at Barnard. And they loved me, I loved them, it was all terrific, a beloved Jewish professor, until somebody stood up and said, we demand to know where you stand on the issue of the women of Palestine. <laughs> I could have ducked it, I didn't. I said, all right, you wanna know where I stand on the issue of apartheid, I oppose it. And Islam is the largest practitioner of both gender and religious apartheid in the world. And the place went crazy, but then crazy. And I had to be hustled out for my protection. It may have been the first such incident in our era like this. And uh, what year was that? 2003, 2003. And it wasn't Barnard's fault. This was a student grassroots generated conference that had rented space there. And, um, and they were African American feminists and it was all too tragic. And then the fact that I was now publishing at a conservative website made my feminist cohort, quote, feel unsafe. But I was shut out of left liberal venues. I had to go wherever I could be published. And this was used as proof positive that I shared conservative reviews about abortion and pay equality and gay marriage, and I was a traitor to feminism. Oh, what a neat trick. Now, I lost cherished friends and colleagues. Between 2003 and 2005, I was attacked as a warmonger and a racist, in bed with Bush, I've never met the man. <laughs> um, but I wasn't attacked in published reviews or interviews, only privately on listserv groups. So a professional psychology group, which revered my work, allowed a graduate student to rant on and on and on about Palestine and the evils of the Zionist entity. They didn't stop her. They did not stop her. And then I was purged from a left feminist group, uh, and I knew many of the women since the late 60s, and also called a Zionist bitch. Uh, it, and I was told by, by the president of a feminist organization that I had better take out a full page ad in the New York Times, full page, 25 grand, 50 grand, whatever it costs, or else I would be destroyed. Well, and then a left feminist uh, who I never met, I hadn't met her, she had the same editor I had, and I was working on the death of feminism. And uh, she managed to gaslight me by telling the editor that I was bad-mouthing the editor all over town. This was not the case. But when it came to light, it was too late because the editor had already canceled the publicity tour and the lectures and the whole thing. Then in 2005, it was a great year for me, um, two left feminists, including Katha Pollitt of Nation Magazine, tried to persuade New York State Now, National Organization for Women, to disinvite me as a keynote speaker because I was a racist and a conservative. And to its credit, Marsha Pappas, to her enormous credit, was the president then, um, resisted, and she turned over the correspondence to me, so I was able to write about it. But at that event, as I gave my keynote speech, WBAI taped me. I was the first feminist on the first feminist program on BAI. Uh, Electra Rewired by Nanette Renown. Think of it, rewiring the daddy complex Electra. And now they came, these young people, to tape me. And they were fools. And they confused what I said about multicultural relativism with multicultural diversity. And they said, you see, she's a racist. She opposes multicultural diversity. And I was saying, we don't say the barbarians are equal to the civilized, that all cultures are equal. They're all the same. My point was lost. And then they did a one-hour program attacking me as a racist. And I listened to about 22 minutes of it, and then I said, it's enough. And then this very attack was used to shelve an interview that I had taped for another State Now chapter on another subject at another channel. Now, this begins to look like censorship, but it's very soft core. There are no footprints. I mean, only I know about it. Now you know about it. I get invited to Cambridge University and it was the 10th anniversary of their women's studies program, and I saw that every other keynoter was a fervent, fiery anti-Zionist. So I made an inquiry, do you have security? On the basis of that mere inquiry, I was disinvited. In, 
<laughs> and then in 2007, I was attacked in a British feminist magazine by a Canadian academic named Sunareth Obani as a racist, along with two other feminists. Guess what? We were all Jews. I guess it was an accident. And I wrote a lengthy rebuttal, because I was leaned on to do so. But I had to make 28 changes to my language to conform to their politically correct way of phrasing things. And I did it. I did it. Now, fast forward for a minute. In 2013, I published An American Bride in Kabul, which won a National Jewish Book Award. And I was invited by C-SPAN, lucky me, to be interviewed for one hour, one-on-one, -on -one, an author interview. And they chose a wonderful reviewer, special one for me. It turned out to be someone named Goldbarg Bashi, whom I did not know. I said, give me a few minutes, I'll get back to you. I quickly found out that, yes, she was married to Hamid Bashi, who's a professor at Columbia's Middle East Studies program, infamous program. And her mentors for her PhD were Leela Abulugod and Gayatri Spivak, who I've crossed swords with in public and in print. So I figured, oh, she's going to just not pay any attention to what I wrote. She's going to attack me as a Zionist and an Islamophobe to invalidate whatever I had to say. So I said, you know, get me some other Iranian, any Iranian, but not this one. <laughs> so that interview was, it never happened. But eventually, C-SPAN did film a lecture I gave at a bookstore, so it wasn't totally lost. But none of this, none of these little examples, and there are hundreds more, none of these, and, and not just to me. See, I'm speaking only for myself now, very personally. If you go around and start talking to other people, you will get as many stories from them on this subject. None of this compares to the non-invitations to speak at feminist conferences, the turned backs of former allies in public settings, including at a memorial service and at an award ceremony. I was getting the award. <laughs> the non-invitations to social and family gatherings, the sarcastic laughter about my work. I was told that, occur that this occurred at a National Women's Studies Conference. And it, that is a conference where there are, apparently, after I did that panel in stores, it led to the creation of a Jewish Women's Caucus, which still continues and is trying to fight the good fight. I didn't go back. But they, in their last um, <laughs> annual conference in San Juan, guess who they had? For their keynote feminist speakers, I'll tell you. Angela Davis, <laughs> Dr. Isla Jad from Beer Zeit, and Rebecca Vilcomerson, Jewish Voice for Peace. Th these are pseudo-feminists. These are not feminists. And what was their subject that was the feminist subject? Palestine. The occupation of, the suffering of, and so on. But you know, this problem was very much bigger than just feminist world. There was the Jewish world. So for example, there was the ADL. In 2003, I was invited and then disinvited by the ADL because I was told they viewed me as the enemy competition. I never wrote a book on this subject. Uh, apparently, Abe Foxman was about to publish a book of his own, a book, by the way, that completely misses the boat, utterly. It's all Christian, Nazi, Europe era. It doesn't take into account the Islamic component or the perfect storm alliance with his funding base, liberals. and. On a panel, very important panel, which if there's time we can talk about it, one of his right-hand men, uh, Ken Jacobson, he dissed me publicly as the Jewish Cassandra. And I figured the man hasn't read his classics because that story didn't end very well. Why does he, is he thinking that all will be destroyed as Troy was? Then I had a lecture in Detroit on anti-Semitism. And the lecture agent got very nervous and said, would you mind talking at the same time in another location on any other subject to women only? I said, I certainly would. I said, why? Well, apparently Foxman had booked the same subject the same night in the largest auditorium for the same hour. 
And when I called his office to suggest, let's just all do it together and donate all the money to Israel, he never called me back. <laughs> but you have to understand, I'm nobody, and he has pulled in 50 to $75 million a year in the, from the Jewish world in the course of his career. So he must be delivering something that the Jewish world wants. So I did not speak in Detroit. In 2003 also, when I spoke at Barnes & Noble on the Upper West Side, a fistfight broke out. I thought this was hot damn, this was good. <laughs> and then members of B'nai Jeshurun said, we're trying to get you invited, but we can't because they tell us you're too conservative. I don't know if that's what the fist fight was about, I doubt it. <laughs> and I, I wasn't invited to my own former synagogue. I wasn't invited to the Jewish Museum. I kid you not, somebody who worked for them came to me almost weeping and he said, they say you're too Jewish. <laughs> I said, no, no. I said, what they mean is I'm not politically correct and they don't know how to handle it. That's what it means. And the liberal Jewish organizations didn't invite me to speak. I, mean, I couldn't figure it, but so be it. Uh, but who could make any of these stories up? That's why I'm sharing them. You can't make this up. This is <laughs> real. Now, those in the West who themselves benefit from free speech and women's rights and gay rights and freedom of religion were defending or at least refusing to criticize the utter absence of such rights in the Muslim world and coming our way. And they focused disproportionately on Israel alone and condemned her. Talk about disproportionate. The Western academics and the media and the human rights groups, the Gansa completely Stalinized and Palestinianized. And they were more obsessed with the occupation of a country that has never existed, <laughs> Palestine, than they were with the real occupation of Muslim and infidel women's bodies in rapidly radicalized Muslim countries and communities and caliphates, lest they too be shunned as racist Islamophobes. Now, amazingly to me, my ideas were warmly and instantly embraced by conservatives and Zionists and Orthodox Jews and by Muslim and ex-Muslim dissidents <coughs> and by some feminists. I developed some new allies and my life slowly changed course, but always one is at an angle after. When you lose all your political and intellectual allies, you know, you're always at a bit of an angle thereafter. So I left the conservative synagogue where I'd prayed for decades. Too many unprovoked fights. I'm, pr I'm davening and they come to fight with me about Israel. And so I joined an orthodox shul, a wonderful <laughs> orthodox shul, where they didn't disagree with me and they didn't bother me. <laughs> and I could daven in peace. And we also shared a common sense of reality and history. Interesting. And my work was reviewed respectfully only at conservative websites. Yeah, they knew I was a feminist firebrand, but I was forgiven our differences as long as I didn't write about abortion or gay marriage, or didn't, whatever my views. I mean, these are not top of my list. I don't think about this day and night. But conservatives, not liberals, not feminists, featured and supported my work on honor-based violence and honor killing, or what I call family-initiated femicide. The distinguished academic journal, Middle East Quarterly, that's Daniel Pipes, publishes my work on honor killing, and I'm now arguably one of the world's experts, scholars in this area. Feminists don't read this. This is tragic, because it's a conservative journal, you see. Now, conservatives and I agree on a lot of things. The superiority of Western civilizational values, the inferiority of Islamic cultures, not Muslim individuals, the fact that Western civilization is being attacked from within by its own intelligentsia, and the clear and present danger of Islamic... Daniel Pipes just convinced me that you can't use the word terrorism anymore because nobody will let you do it, so he's using some other words because the minute you use the word terrorist, well, but the RDF is terrorist too. Um, radical, fundamentalist, barbarian, totalitarian Islam. Okay, so the, the, um, the fact that Israel is the symbol for the entire Western enterprise and that there's so much free speech and academic freedom protection being given to big lies and um, 
I was very grateful that conservatives welcomed my byline. But I had lost my lifelong intellectual and political allies, which means that when you do a film about second wave feminism, I'm not included. When you do an article about it, I'm not included. I'm not asked. I'm not consulted. When there are issues that come up, they're not going to ask me. And that's the deal. That's the price. It's a small price. In terms of anti-Semitism and Israel advocacy, I really am the new kid on the block. So even though I was treated as prescient and sometimes as prophetic, I wasn't a long timer and I had few connections to the world of organized Jewry. And the more I saw, the less I wanted to become a professional Jew. Always everywhere, promising everybody anything, my begging bowl at the ready. Thus, between being seen as a traitor by feminists and as an independent loner by the organized Jewish world, I was never properly funded. So for the last 15 years, I've had no salary. And I've had to cover more than half of my operating expenses, which are considerable. And again, when I say me, multiply me by a team of 2,000 or a team of 3,000 that will be essential for our survival. So a webmaster, a website, an IT team, a research assistant, equipment, office costs, this is expensive stuff. So if I don't get funded, this might be one of the last lectures I get to give. I'm done. I, and I don't want to stop, but reality is biting me. Now, forget this. What's far worse than this is that despite valorous grassroots efforts, including my own, we have lost the war of ideas. Israel is now utterly defamed, and we face a tsunami of hatred. We have lost the campuses, the human rights organizations, the media, the United Nations. We've lost the ideological high ground. That means the truth has lost the high ground. And it's almost impossible to convince people with closed minds that the most abhorred settlement has always been Tel Aviv, that the settlements refer to Israel, the Jewish and one and only Jewish state, in the Middle East. Now, lately, there's increasing evidence of, uh, it's anecdotal, that Israeli academics have been disinvited, not invited, not asked to, to present papers at conferences where they were asked before. If they send in scientific work, it's at the bottom of the pile. This is another kind of soft core undeclared boycott, but a boycott it is. So mil Israel's ability to defend herself militarily is not in question, but her right to do so is very much in question. So now Israel is surrounded by a hostile international community, 24-7, legally, economically, politically, and in part because we lost this ideological war. After 15 years on this particular front line, I have to conclude that one cannot win such a war if one refuses to fight it. The barefoot, underfunded, unfunded, or underfunded cognitive warriors, Charles included, have not been, although you might now be, have not been supported by the large Jewish organizations or by the Israeli government. Listen, read my lips. To fight back would probably cost hundreds of millions of dollars each and every year. And the effort would have to be coordinated. That means no two Jews, three synagogues, coordinated like a military team. And one cannot win a war of ideas when some of one's own people are part of the problem. Now, I have in the past written about Jewish anti-Zionism and Jewish perfectionism vis-a-vis -vis Israel only. I don't think the problem is one of self-hatred. I think it's one of opportunism and cowardice. And I think that liberal and left-wing Jews, why not? They want to lead safe and happy lives. And who can blame them? They don't want to have to put up with what I just had to put up with. And they don't want to become pariahs in their communities by taking up the cause of a defamed Israel. But here's what's going on. Rabbi Hillel famously asked, if I am not for myself, then who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, then what am I? And if not now, when? Zionists, both Jews and Christians, Orthodox Jews, are answering Reb Hillel's first question. 
conservatives are answering his first question. Left liberal Jews are answering his second question. Neither group is answering both questions. So the Israel firsters are not committed to a secular human rights agenda, chas v'chalila. The left liberals are not viewing this moment in history as exceptionally perilous. The cost of remaining silent. Isn't it obvious? Don't we already know it? The failure to resist and overthrow barbarism always, always means more suffering, more death, more despair. Surviving victims are always haunted by what the good people fail to do more so than by what the bad people did. The evil people are evil, but what about the good people? Where were they? They cried out and they weren't rescued or they weren't believed afterwards and few helped them bring their torturers to justice. When good people do nothing to stop radical evil, a soul-eating despair enters the world as well as an enormous cynicism. The jihadists know they can keep going for a very long while. No one has stopped them so far. The Arab and Central Asian Christians who are being slaughtered and crucified in their beds and churches, they know that the Western church will not save them, hasn't done so, so far. The three million or more Syrian refugees know that America does not have their back. The girls and women raped and impregnated by ISIS and Boko Haram know they are on their own. Despite 9-11, 3-11, 7-7, the West has not really yet paid the price for failing to stop far off genocides. Today we watch the propaganda, they put out their own beheadings, and it's death pornography, and in a, in a sense we're complicit with voyeurs, we collaborate, we watch it, and we don't stop it. It's happening on our watch, and it keeps happening, and we don't stop it, and we know about it. And we refuse to understand that it's coming here, that it is here, that it's here, and that only the most extraordinary vigilance has, and maybe some luck, has stopped hundreds, if not thousands, of jihad attacks here. Now, evil always triumphs when good people do not stand against it. Like Europeans and Americans in the Nazi era, you could have privately disagreed with Hitler, who cares? It didn't save 11 million lives. One must resist actively or the devil always wins. Covering up Stalin's crimes, 40 to 50 million died. That's not resisting the devil. According to Bonhoeffer, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. So what must we do? As Jews, we're commanded to stand against evil in our time, to right injustice, but we're not commanded, thank God, to complete the work. It's very long past the midnight hour, but here's what should have been done and what we have to now do. And this project may take 100 years, but there is no alternative if we're serious about deprogramming people and teaching them the truth about Israel, the Jews, the West, and Islam. Some people estimate that Israel's enemies have spent at least $100 million a year, each and every year, for at least 50 years or more to defame and delegitimize Israel. Towards this end, governments, European governments, have funded NGOs, think tanks, professors, students, conferences, human rights groups, and the United Nations. What has Israel spent? What have Jewish organizations in the diaspora spent? What have good people everywhere spent? Although I certainly support it, I support every effort that individuals have been bravely making, I don't think that standing up with an Israeli flag at Berkeley or San Francisco is equivalent to taking back the campuses. And I don't think that training a handful of future students to engage more effectively in on-campus shouting matches or counter demonstrations will do the job. Nor do I think that documenting the big lies, something that I do all the time, is anywhere near enough because who reads me? Only the people who already agree with me, whose blood is already boiling. 
we need the equivalent of a global iron dome to protect Israel from defamation. What would that consist of? Well, we would need to begin with a worldwide, multi-language, pro-Israel, pro-America, pro-West Al Jazeera, a TV station that focuses not only on Israel or even on the Middle East, uh, that covers the whole wor world, but very high quality. But when it comes to the Middle East, just tells the truth. This may cost billions of dollars each and every year, just this. And this must be, it can't be done on the cheap, and it can't be staffed by the con artists of sensation. Even though Kim Kardashian is very popular, she's not useful in this endeavor. So this would have to be a sober undertaking of very high quality with team players not breakaway egotists. Maybe we can't even have Jews working on it. So we have the talent, but we don't have the money. We need to fund the deprogramming of all those who have been brainwashed into this mass anti-Zionist psychosis. Campus-wide, mandatory, all-day teach-ins. Mandatory, all-day teach-ins. Every single semester to start with on at least 2,000 American campuses, which is less than half of the existing 4,500. And Charles should be training the professors. ISCAP should be doing just that, but it has to become mandatory. And this is barely a start. The true history of the Middle East, including the history of the Jews and infidels and Jews in Muslim <laughs> countries and religious minorities in Muslim countries has to be made known. Americans don't seem to know about it. And in order to balance a very unbalanced view of history, we have to teach students and professors about Islam's long history of imperialism, colonialism, conversion via the sword, anti-black racism, slavery, and of course, religious and gender apartheid. So when we are saying the West must atone for its enormous sins, yeah, well, human errors, all cultures, that doesn't happen on the American campus. Now, I have a lot of other ideas, all of them. All of them require funding and organization and serious government backing and philanthropic backing. But we have to outwit the opposition globally because that's their chosen playing field. Israel's got it covered militarily. Globally, naked to the winds. The anti-BDS legislation that's just passed in South Carolina and is about to pass in Illinois, should be passed in every American state. And we need new international legislation that doesn't single out only Israel at the UN and at The Hague. And we should, in my opinion, legally sue to get the Muslim Brotherhood off the American campus. But we have to shed our illusions permanently. We cannot expect that conditions will always improve or that one country or another will always be a safe haven for Jews. We have repeated our history many times. Our ancestors suffered in exile for more than 2,000 years. And while we are privileged to live at a time when our homeland has been restored to us, it was foolish to have thought that Jew hatred would suddenly become extinct or that Israel would not remain under siege. As Jews, as Israelis, as members of a nation holy unto God, we must understand and never forget that ours is an eternal struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, an important and sober lecture. So I'll, I'll start off... Uh, well, people, I, mean, I, I, get, I told some jokes along the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anti-Semitism and humor. There's a, there's a connection. It's a good book. Mm. Yeah, that's the next book. So I want to ask you a question. Um, and then we'll open up to, to the public. You didn't talk about the current Obama administration. Yeah. And, uh, How much know, can I take? <laughs> and we're weeks away from the deadline regarding Iran. 
The Obama administration has been using, uh, used the policy of engagement, engaging Islam, engaging the Muslim Brotherhood in the Sunni world and other groups, and certainly engaging the Obama administration has been using a policy of engagement. They've been engaging the Muslim Brotherhood in the Sunni world and other parties in the Sunni world. And they're also engaging the Iranian revolutionary regime. The Iranian revolutionary regime continues to call for the annihilation of Israel and the Jewish people. Can you comment on the, on the effect of engagement on Muslims around the world, from Paris to the United States, and, and, and issues of anti-Semitism. I didn't know he was going to ask me this question, but in short, it empowers them. It unleashes the riots and the attacks against individual Jews, and then the uh, legal uh, moves to attack the Jewish state. That's what it does. That means everybody's the same, people are like each other, just because, and Obama has been quoted, merely because uh, Iran is sounding genocidal in its intention towards Israel, doesn't mean that we can't deal with them and that down the road maybe they might change their mind. So Obama, he's lost, but we're lost along with him, and there are many but remember, many Jews have voted for him, and they had, and they answered Hillel's second question. We have to bear this in mind without scorn. They're answering Hillel's second question. We have to help the others. We have to help the people here. We have to function in a multilateral way. We can't just be ugly Americans out on our own. Maybe we need to be isolated. I mean, these are all, I mean, and these are legitimate concerns. What about jobs, unemployment in America? We can't save the whole world, although I can assure you that only American military boots on the ground have kept the shelters for battered women opened in Kabul and Kandahar. The minute the boots are out, everyone will be murdered. But it's a fair enough question. Maybe we are not morally obliged to do that which cannot be done. So Obama, in dealing with Iran, and by the way, I, I'm told that the deadline is softening because, what, I mean, Iran is just going to get money for continuing to talk. Why wouldn't they keep talking without closing the deal? And what kind of deal is it? We all know that it's not enforceable, that they're not allowing, they're on record, they won't allow um, it's, uh, unsupervised sudden visits of their uranium enrichment project. You know, and how many men are running and one woman running for the Republican nomination? It's like clowns in a car. I mean, they might as well be Jews. I mean, everyone is, it might as well be the Knesset. So Hillary Clinton, who's going to run against her as a Democrat? Who's going to do that? Sanders. Bloomberg. As a Democrat, he's an independent. Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> not a chance. Not a chance. Not a, well, actually, she was exposed as having uh, engaged in real estate ventures that are somewhat against her ruling ideology. Not that this should matter, because look at what the Clintons engage in. But, you know, they're protected by it, since we already know how they skirt just the curve of the law and get away with it time after time. It's not going to be used against them, alas. So, you answer your question. Me? Please. No, I think um, in a nutshell, I would argue that this is institutionalizing anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and it's giving oxygen to very reactionary bad forces throughout the world. And last year, I think a good example of it is in France during the Gaza war, the French government outlawed demonstrations last summer. And the day after they outlawed the demonstrations, Thousands of young Muslims came onto the streets and they beat the police. So I, you know, you speak into the mic. I don't. It's okay. You have to be so we're, we're, polite. We're going to open it up for questions. I don't want to take away. So no, um, no, or answers. If people have answers, don't hold back. Okay. So here, and can you repeat the question for the camera? Yes. If it's a short question, I can repeat it for the camera. If it's a long one, I can't. Mm -hmm. What do you think we can do about that? Um, I guess it's a law that came out today that said. 
that people who are Americans who are born in Jerusalem cannot claim. Yeah. Okay, 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 I got the question. She's asking about the Supreme Court decision, hard on the heels of the right to wear hijab on the job, which I'll discuss in a minute, uh, decision. Um, the, the Supreme Court essentially ruled that, see, Congress passed a law, piece of legislation that neither President Bush nor President Obama wants to enforce. The Supreme Court said they believe in separation of powers and they can't override that separation, nor can they force the uh, executive into doing the right thing. That is my sense of that decision, although I haven't read it from beginning to end. If anyone has, speak up. So it's not that it's against the, you can put down Jerusalem on your passport. You cannot put down Jerusalem, comma, Israel. Even West Jerusalem? How about Tel Aviv? Is that gonna become an issue as I fear? Okay, so maybe that clarifies it a little bit. The downside is it opens it up for Obama to negotiate Jerusalem and give it away. Well, Bush didn't move the American embassy to Jerusalem either. Neither has any president before him, and Obama <coughs> just followed their lead. We have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Yes. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, and I belong to the Fox Lopes Co-op. And um, last um, in May, we have general meetings once a month. And VDC is trying to infiltrate into the co-op. So if you've heard about it, I was the one who caused the riot. Good! I was the one who said, not, this is not, you know, I got up there. Oh, wait, let me, let me just pause. She's raising a very important local issue about the BDS people who live in Park Slope, my old neighborhood, uh, who have wanted the food co-op on Union Street. Is it still there? Yes, of course. Okay the food co-op not to stock Israeli products. Now, Israeli products from the Negev, or from Judea and Samaria, or in general, or Ahava from the Dead Sea. They don't want to touch it, right? right. She says she caused a riot against this. I Speak. Did. Yeah. <laughs> well, good for you, good for you. They went up, you know, it's like they are bullying Obama. They started, the media started to put pictures up of, you know, so-called what Israelis are doing to hate that word Palestinian, you know. And they started putting pictures up and they started to, and I'm not going to sit there and be bullied. You know, they are bullying me. They're telling me that I'm a terrible person. What and kind of riot people, did you cause? Mm -hmm. I went up on the stage, like my little old leftist attitude. I went up on the stage and I said, Take it down, Israel. Take it down. <laughs> take it down. No, take it down. She defended Israel's honor and was triumphant. <laughs> yeah, and, and then they kept going on and saying, you know, settlements. I said, that's a lie. It's Jewish land. Israel doesn't occupy anything. You're a liar. And everybody keep, came over to me and said, and I said, you know, they kept saying, keep quiet, keep quiet. You know, they threatened me. I said, are you threatening? Can everyone out? hear her? Are, it, it, um, it, it, for the sake of sanity, probably what will fly is disputed territories. That phrase might be useful, although... I, I don't know the political. I'm not political. I'm not, you know, we've met once before, and I would like to talk to you once before, years and years ago, about, you know, and, about, and I'm really tired of, you know, as a woman, they, the, the women's rights, you know, they taught us how to have... That we ha they gave us the right to have abortion. But they didn't teach us how to keep our children. And now, as uh, women, we shouldn't be yeah. talking about the poor Arabs with their problems as a woman. We have to deal with women here and what, you know, like a woman has to be... Okay, wait, we're going off no, topic. Uh, you can talk to me afterwards. I will okay. talk to you. But I'm saying that... I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be bullied by people. I'm not going to sit there and take lies. That's good. That's, that's Were you alone? Were you the only one? Well, I basically, some people came up 
you know, they came up, and it was written up about it in the paper. As, thank God, not my name, not my name. Okay. But Were you the only one? It's just a simple question. And, um, Were you the only one standing up no, for Israel? Some me, not okay, many. good. So you're a leader. Not many. Are you about to you're about to run into they trouble? Oh yeah, well the Israelis are harassing, you know. I said this is not democracy, this is Jewish. Okay, let's let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. On Union Street in Park Slope Wait, in Brooklyn. When, when was the meeting? The last meeting? When was the last the meeting? meeting? Well when I with May and May. You might have a, a crew here. If yeah. you linger afterwards, maybe you'll get supporters from this very audience. Yeah. Yes, I, and then you next. I know. You can't resist, okay. I know. Okay. <laughs> Whenever there is some, uh, a big flood of great uh, prejudice, genocidal prejudice, like anti-Semitism, I always say we have to ask one question. Who benefits? Now, I'm not. I know who benefits among the Islamists. That that's that's definitely not my question, or the Palestinians for that matter. My question is, why should it? Why should feminists who have uh, fought just to be accepted as as human beings for years and years? What are they getting out of this? And, and uh, this goes for the civil libertarians, the human rights people. I don't understand why they think they're going to benefit from this and what is their motivation? They are benefiting. Her question is, why would feminists who fought so hard for women's rights for so long think that they're going to get something out of being obsessed with Palestine and not obsessed with women's rights any longer? And the answer is very simple, unfortunately. First, they're getting, they're avoiding being shunned. They're avoiding being called racists and Islamophobes. They're also getting published and they're getting awards and they're invited to parties and they might be able to keep tenure or get a job in the media, on and on and on. Because if you say anything at all these days that's positive or true about Israel, you're on, you're blacklisted. Okay? So that they're getting out of it their uh, livings, their social networks, their funding sources. Okay? That's the answer. Yes, I said I would. I think what you spent the a lot of time, very accurately, I think, analyzed the American and Western left, which has now become uh, anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian, and uh, I'm enraged by it, but I sort of understand it on a gut level. What I don't understand is the Israeli left, which is also, to a great extent, pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel, and I would love to hear your analysis of how that evolved. All right, so he, he's saying he gets on a gut level why Western leftists would, it's Stalin's triumph from the grave. That's what's happening. So Western leftists can't give up that Marxist paradigm and that belief that human beings can, uh, better than God, perfect society, and if not, they're going to kill you if you try to stop them, right? They cannot give up that way of thinking. But then he's asking, why would Israeli leftists Suicidally, by the way, the Western leftists are suicidal here. It's the same death trip. It's the same uh, Thanatos trip. So I give an anecdote just so we can laugh. I'm sitting in the mid-70s with the rising feminist stars of Israel in Jerusalem, and they're complaining so bitterly about the Israeli government. I finally said, all right then you have to apply for political asylum in Saudi Arabia, you know? I mean, no. the thing is that there's no perspective, this belief that you can keep criticizing the authorities, tradition, the parent figures, the leaders, and, and not look at in a balanced way by the neighborhood that you're living in. So again, some of them are answering Rabbi Hillel's second question. They, it's on their watch as Jews. They want ethical, 
uh, actions, they want to help people who are suffering, and they're doing this as Jews, Dafka, especially. So that explains a little bit of it, and then it's what I said, it, they're keeping their jobs, they think they'll be sent to the gas chambers last, <laughs> they'll open the gates for the barbarians who will spare them. Uh, maybe they're more terrified than the rest of us, and they want to deny even more hotly than we do the the awful things that are happening. It's not like they will happen. They are happening right now. I've written many articles about this. Why do you think uh, that we, uh, I certainly have never heard from Netanyahu about the West Bank the history of the West Bank is not occupied territory. It was, if it was occupied, it's been occupied by the Ottomans for hundreds of years. It was under the British. I'll mandate. repeat him. I'll After repeat him. That, He's saying was, if there was any occupation ever, it was Ottoman occupation and then British occupation. Go ahead. He's talking about British Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. And following that was the Jordanians. Yes. So there has never been any government there other, you know, that's been Palestinian. Why does, and I, I've read books that, 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 unless you defend it and say that it's yours, you lose that right, even if it is yours in, in, in the international law. So, well, he says, why unless you do. Why don't we hear from, like, Netanyahu? Why does that even challenge the words occupied territories all the time? Uh, why does, why, because he's asking how come Prime Minister Netanyahu doesn't say, listen, we're not occupying anything. And if anything, we are the indigenous peoples of this region uh, and have archaeological proof, historical proof, we have coins, we have jugs, we have relics, we have the Torah, we have everything. And they don't have anything. So how could this reversal, this Orwellian reversal, have occurred? The Jews are the interlopers, the colonizing forces, as opposed to the returning to the homeland, indigenous people of the region. How could this come about? I just pointed out that 50 to 60 to 70 years of well-funded, highly choreographed propaganda brought it about. But Text, Netanyahu is going along. Netanyahu is not going along with anything. I'm sure if he could, he would say this. He has. He has. Okay. Yes, and then you. Yes. So, so, uh, so, do you find any hope in the current makeup of the Israeli government? Uh, example: uh, Minister Hatavelli, her statement saying that we do have a religious right and claim to the land. I agree with her. The minister should say that also around the world. And well, she's in the cabinet. What do you yeah. want? So, so, it's a figure. It's a so if finally, is there maybe a, 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 a possibility of a turnaround coming from Israel to counter at least the leftists in Israel? Perhaps. Yeah. He, he's saying why he's following up this other good question. Why has the Israeli leaders and government officials not pointed out that they're not occupying anything, that this is theirs? And, and if I may, just as a, uh, as a follow-up to your issue as to have needing big money to counter this effort. Uh, just yesterday, today, the day before, we hear about a meeting in Las Vegas with Adelson and Sabin, which is mega money in the Jewish yeah. community. So yeah. finally, are we starting to wake up at least here in this country to try to counter um, the uh, Well, are we waking up now because of Adelson's meeting in Las Vegas over this past weekend? Why do I think not? Why do I think that anything that's orchestrated by Rabbi Shmuley Boteach is not going to be the kind of thing that I would do or that Charles would do? I mean, I could be wrong, right? So, yes, now it's all the buzz, it's all the rage, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, they're waking up, but what are they really going to do? You know, and, and by the way, I was aghast at the lineup. We're talking about Adelson's Las Vegas meeting. He, he should fund us. I'm happy to accept his money. But um, there were 50 groups pitted against each other in a dead heat competition, a gladiatorial sport, right? 
with PowerPoints, with a Shabbos guy to do the clicking, you know, for the for the Orthodox. And what kind of a setup is this? This is like speed dating. You know, I mean, what can come of it? What good can come of it? Yeah. And then who makes the decisions about which projects get funded? The men who just happen to have the money. That doesn't mean that they know. I don't know anything about money, but I know about what I know about. Yes, yeah, somebody's dying to speak. So and you then, also said comments, so I'll make a comment about that. You, yeah. you were talking about beginnings. These are beginnings. It's very important here. It's a new, more conservative, more right <coughs> cabinet. Knesset in the Knesset. There's some totally and a number of other things. Now, Polly wait, wait, stop, stop. Right. She's, saying, she's saying that I was talking about the need for beginnings, and she's saying now there is a new government in power, fragile, but in power, and Adelson has a meeting uh, with at least, the focus was only on the BDS campaign, it wasn't on everything else, That's it was fine. just on that. Let them start on the BDS campaign. That's fine, but the fact is they're willing to put their money behind it. Safran's already talking about, they were talking about suing uh, the orange company owner, Big time. He's already recanted. She's He's talking about orange. Recanted. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And they're talking about really making efforts to stop a lot of this. I, I think all the credit. To do no, no, but as I said, it's a 50 to 100 year project. It and be, it's yeah, I mean, I don't whatever it takes, it may be longer. It may be an eternal project. And so for the Jews, perhaps yeah. that's always true. That's, that's correct. Really eternal. Yes, yes. Thank as you. And yeah, as you yeah. so eloquently said in, in your concluding comment, eternal, it, it's our responsibility. It's really all of, it's not about finding this rich guy that's going to bail us out or gal. It's about each and every one of us going home tonight or tomorrow morning super early before you go to work or during the day studying your basics, Israel 101. You, understanding that the correct word, language is dispute and having your own talk in your own synagogue or your own group of people. Each and every one of us. Right. She's saying that each people. of us can begin to make a difference in our own lives, in our own circles. But I have to say to you, verily, I'm going to say unto you, it's not enough. Even though it is no, no, important, it's, not, it's important. It's important. We all, right, we want to keep raising and raising, but what I'm saying is, is that I teach classes in synagogues. I go out and do things. I, I, I just, why? Because I woke up one day and I said, you know, I re we really need to learn our own basic responses and get out there. And you'd be amazed, it has an effect. So each one of us needs to be responsible and keep raising level. And just as you, your, your book is so important and what you're saying. Oh yeah, read the book. You know what, you know what should happen? Adelson should buy hundreds, thousands of <laughs> copies. No, I'm sorry, and give them away for free. Give them away for free to the students who are otherwise disinformed. Yes. Yeah, I promised this man in the front, and then you. Yes, uh, a comment and a question. My comment is this. Forty years ago, I followed a rabbi. I joined an organization started by him. And your experience with the left and with, Jew and with the major Jewish community organizations or his experience. That rabbi was Mar Rabbi Mark Hunt. Why did I know where you were going? <laughs> okay, now, yeah. wait. Okay, so I, I, I just He's saying that, that Maya Kahana had similar experiences to, not with the feminist world, but, but the left. with the left that I've just recounted. For instance, calling people racists automatically oh, yeah. if you're a Zionist, or uh, with regard to the major Jewish organizations disinviting you. Uh, Rabbi Kahane called yes. out the ADL a long time ago, okay? So I, I'm not too surprised about the ADL. My question is this. Wait, well, let me just repeat what you said. Maya Kahana, who should rest in peace, was also demonized as a racist, mainly because he was a Zionist, and he also called out the ADL a long time ago, so he's not surprised about what I've shared. Okay, my question is this. What's your take on Pamela Geller? She is bringing attention. Okay, you have to not ask me this question, because I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> what? I don't owe you an answer, my friends. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. He's asking. No, no, no. I. There are. The problem for me, I'm a scholar. 
I'll look at a Supreme Court decision and I'll, or a court decision, and I'll say, oh, this is what it means. People who are amateurs in general and who are ideologues par excellence will use anything to make a point. This is not so wise for me to do. I don't do that. So the immediate response to this earlier Supreme Court decision about the right to wear hijab on the job over and above private enterprises' right to impose a dress code uh, was not the imposition of Sharia law, which is taking over the country. Not at all. It's American law at its finest in terms of religious, uh, legalizing religious freedoms. I found something in reading the decision that was very troubling, though, because it was based, the EEOC argued her case. It was not CARE. The Muslim Brotherhood may have you know, been supportive in some unknown way, but it's not relevant because the EEOC represented her from 2008 on. And what that means is that the court adopted the language of the EEOC, and it was this Samantha Aloff's, quote, understanding of Islam, they said, EEOC and the Supreme Court, um, that incline them to say it's a religious freedom right, it's her right, it's because she understood that in Islam she'd have to cover her head or her hair or wear headgear, which means that the next thing that could happen is another woman will come along and say it's her understanding of Islam that she's got to mask her face. Now these distinctions are very important for us to make and to be clear about. There's another example because a whole bunch of amateurs wanted me to uh, pronounce Sharia law is taking over in the American courtroom based on a particular case in New Jersey where a judge uh, didn't punish the man for beating or raping his wife as so charged, but said, oh, he says it's his religion. Now, I've looked at enough divorce and custody cases to understand that judges will say the craziest things, and they get away with it. Within American law, they have the discretion to rule at whim at the trial level. So this was not, and I said, you know, I can't really say that this case is a clear, open and shut example of how Sharia law is influencing America and taking us down. I said, you have to find me another case. So the problem is, and I will not attack Pamela Geller while she's under siege. Absolutely not. So, uh, and people should be allowed <laughs> to, this is free speech in this country. Although, you know, let's, some of us who are religious here would not enjoy having our religious ideas mocked and scorned in the public square. We would suffer it. Maybe we'd put up with it because we'd understand, but we wouldn't like it. We wouldn't like it one bit. So I don't know about the effectiveness of provoking the opposition and drawing their fire and saying, I got you, I'm here, come and get me. I don't know, we'll see. Is this effective? It might be. It might be counterproductive. It's sort of vulgar for me, for me. I'm not saying for somebody else. Thank you. Wait, wait, excuse, you have to be quiet. You have to be quiet. And we also, we No, no, you have to be quiet over there. We only have time for a couple more yes. questions. Yes, very fast question. Okay. This is not gonna be fast, I'm sorry. No, it has to be, because. Okay. Part of the problem, even if we had unlimited funding, is the left has lost its engagement with ideas, its ability to listen to a disagreeing voice, and its relationship with facts. And True. this pains me. During the first Gulf War, someone said, oh, Israel is getting bombed because it's between um, Iraq and um, Iraq and Kuwait. He said, it's really not between Iraq and Kuwait. I showed her a map. Maybe it moved. Mm -hmm. the yeah. I think that if we had unlimited funding, we would still come to this imperviousness to hear an opposing voice. Part of if you had unlimited funding has to be exclusive. No, wait, wait. She said something first, very important, that the left, and I would broaden that to the intelligentsia, the academics, the yeah. human rights activists, the United Nations employees, has lost the ability to agree to disagree, to accept a dissenting opinion on anything before they go ballistic and curse you. And I think now. that part of this Hasbara 
has to be addressed exclusively to Israel, to the intelligentsia, to the academic elite class, that their self-respect should be great enough that they can hear an opposing voice. And as, a, as someone who's supposed to be living a life of ideas, they should respect mm -hmm. themselves and respect their opponents and be able to engage and debate rather than She said that if they are living a life of ideas, they should be able to debate and engage and accept differences. But in fact, they're not living a life of ideas. Their ideology trumps ideas. There is no independent creative thinking. And those of us who do just that uh, fall between many cracks and are punished, as I've just spoken about. And an unlimited budget They're not thinkers. They're not thinkers yeah. is part of the problem. They're herd conformists. Then how are we going to make a crack in it? Leadership. All right. Yeah. They, we will. We will. Faith. And action. <laughs> There's a question in the back here. Yes. I think I might have thought of the answer. Stand up, stand up. <laughs> Hold the arrows. Look around you. Who's under 35 in this room? You have to reach the people who are 35 and under, we. or 40 and under, and reach them clearly and succinctly and make them understand that if they don't get on the bandwagon, then this won't be. Our defense of our position will never succeed. Now, she makes a very important point that we here who are concerned and who have gathered together are people of a certain age who have lived a certain experience. And we have lost, when I said that we've lost the ideological high ground, I should have added to it, we've lost the coming generations, which is why I want Adelson to buy up all these books, thousands of them, thousands, of them, and give them out. And I'm serious, I'm not joking. I'm utterly serious. They don't know how to read? This is a former professor like myself. They don't read? Okay. What, All right. What All more, right. Wait, wait, wait. More, we have time for one more question. Does so anybody like to ask a question? One more answer or question? An <laughs> answer is good. Somebody has a question? Somebody's pointing. Yeah. Oh, no my God. <laughs> And we also like to, okay, over here. No, 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 no. No, no, here, over in the front row. Yes, all right. I remember during the, the recent war, I was active on Facebook, and that's not necessarily our generation. Wait, which war? There are uh, so many. Gaza. Oh, Wait, that's terrible. You know. yeah. And, uh, you know, another issue is really funding, if you want to hit young people, getting more involved with Twitter and, and Facebook and other things in a concerted, coordinated way with uh, institutions that you're talking about. And I, you know, I was just wondering your thoughts on that. And also your thoughts, Charles, on the Adelson situation. I don't know if you were there. I believe you were in Las Vegas, according to what I saw on Facebook. And if there are any questions you have, that there is some positive impetus for this. No, no, it's for you. What was the question? I'm sorry. What was the Oh, we need to have internet defense forces, which are in formation. They do exist, but I said not funded. And it needs to be funded in a major way. It has to be the right people who not only know how to hack, but who know how to put out visuals and how to immediately uh, uh, sort of get rid of the big lie and tell the truth and have a visual and have cameras and but in many many languages around the clock this is money to get this done it, assuming that you've got you know a high nerd factor of genius mm -hmm. now All right, so this yeah. so I, I would say yes. that the the meeting in Las Vegas uh, I would argue is in a, a great moment a great moment. It's the first time in the United States of America that the community is now waking up, perhaps imperfectly, but there's an acknowledgement that we are at war. There's an acknowledgement that we need to study and understand and map and confront our enemy. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu addressed the Global Forum on Anti-Semitism. It's the first time that the Prime Minister of Israel attended the Global Forum on Anti-Semitism about three weeks ago. The Israeli government are now, different ministries are apparently fighting over who's going to deal with the BDS and contempor contemporary anti-Semitism. So I think as imperfect as it is and as imperfect as it will be, this is the, a historic moment. The Israeli government and the American Jewish community 
I won't say the organizations, but the community has now acknowledged that we have a serious problem. And that's the first step. And I think it's a great moment, actually. Wait, I must say something. Wait. Here's what I have to say. I hope you're right, but time is running out. And we are so behind the curve. And um, I don't know whether the very same people who denied reality and who don't know how to deal with it and aren't intellectuals or who aren't cognitive warriors, I don't know whether they really have what it takes now to come up with the projects and put them into play and fund them down history, down the, the road of history. I just don't know. I'm not pessimistic. I'm totally committed to fighting back and to winning. I'm totally committed to the truth. Uh, what I wonder about is who's going to bring it about. And, you know, and, and the very people like Netanyahu, I can't imagine why he wouldn't have attended this conference sooner or addressed it sooner, but now that he's been forced to do so, what do you envision as steps? The, I mean, the Israeli government should long ago have had a, uh, a cabinet ministry on uh, cognitive warfare on the lethal narrative, but really, and not just the global anti-Semitism ministry, who didn't even have a secretary, that was Aviva uh, Raj Shekta after Natan Sh Sharansky, but something major, major, I don't see major happening in terms of a cabinet level position. Do you? Tell me. Yeah. Speak. Uh, look, I think there's been a denial for many years. Uh, there's the beginning, the Jewish community in the United States, I think, was beginning to deal with some of the symptoms of a problem that they didn't understand the cause of the disease. And I think for the first time, the Israeli government and the American Jewish community That's acknowledges... That's the right-wing, conservative, orthodox branch of the Jewish community. It's not the Jews who voted for Obama. No, it's it's not. not the Jews who are going to be funding the next Democrat into office. I mean, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree it's something. It's I'm a not, new thing. I'm not the, uh, the eternal optimist, but yesterday at the Jerusalem Post event, oh, yeah. something's happening. Yeah. Something is happening in the American Jewish community. I don't just think it's the right wing, the Fox News, the No, no, Orthodox. that was Adelson. That was only Adelson, not the no, J Post. No, it wasn't Adelson. It was, uh, it was um, Chaim Saban. He was at the table, yes, he, yes. he was at the meeting, and he is the biggest supporter, the biggest Democrat uh, contributor. It was the Democrat and Republican. It was left and it was right. And even though the media is demonizing it as a right-wing uh, uh -huh. conspiracy, it's not. The left was there, but not, not the J Street, because right. you know, we weren't, the, the problem wasn't invited into the room. But there were mainstream liberals, there were conservative people there, there were many organizations. So I think there's an awakening. Yeah. And there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that there's a disease. There's an acknowledgement that there's an enemy. And that's the first step. Right. Let's start mapping and decoding as imperfect yeah. as it no, will no, be. No, no, no. I, I totally agree. But, you know, we've never managed to shake anti-Semitism, have we? No. You won't. Uh, so that may... I am, I'm now thinking about what the goals would have to be. All right, listen, you, right. you've been a very appreciative uh, group. Thank you. Thank you. So on, uh, on behalf of ISGAP, uh, I want to thank Phyllis very much for her amazing body of knowledge.